welcome to Financial Buddy TV. My name is Nicolette Mashili and of course I am your financial buddy. I am sitting today with Marius Brando and we're going to discuss all things property. I'm really excited because this feature is brought to you by Centered Around Property and it is an initiative by Central Developments. Today we're talking why is property so expensive in South Africa? I mean we hear this all the time on the streets, why is property so expensive? But while property is quite an expensive asset in South Africa, it is one of those that the bank is still willing to finance for. But you guys have been asking me this question. Why is it that the bank is going to give you money for a car, but not a property? So let's welcome Marius Brando. Hello, Hi, I'm so excited to have you here because I've had conversations with you before and I know your passion for property. I mean, 14 years in the industry, you've worked on over 28 projects at Central Developments. That's incredible. Let's talk a little bit about this. Why is it that banks are willing to give people loans for cars and not for property? We often have it. Our clients drive in here mm -hmm. with a million and a half uh, grand's worth of prop, uh, cars, oh, mm. but they battle to get a home loan. Mm. I'm, I'm not in the boardrooms at the back. Yes. To me, it makes sense. A car has got three or four trackers in. If you don't pay it, they come and get it at the mall and you have to Uber out. Yeah. With a house, the bank is still willing to lend you money for a house mm. if your credit record is sufficient. Um, but it does create a dilemma. If you don't pay your home loan, your grandma might be living with you. Your baby might be living with you. Now they can't, it's a social problem. If they kick you out of your house for not paying, there's a social problem. What happens with the grandma? Yeah. What happens with the baby? Where a property, if you, a car, if you lose your car, you can still Uber and taxi and cycle and walk. It doesn't create that social problem that property does. The reason why banks will still lend you money on property is because property values escalate. Absolutely. And you can't run away with it. <laughs> somebody actually said the other day, because somebody was also, there's a place in, in, in Soweto where it's a, it's a chill out spot called Konka. And somebody was like, why do people drive M2s um, um, to Konka but don't uh, buy homes? And someone's like, well, how are you going to drive your house to Konka so people can see you're doing well? Exactly. And I was like, well, that's actually quite funny. Let's talk about it. I mean, it, we, we, we don't need to go into the whole conversation about how important property is as an asset but how does a South African an average South African access property that's thankfully where the banks do come mm. so you are able to apply for a home mm. loan mm. Um, and you're at the moment with the amazing interest rate that we currently have your bond repayment and levies and rates is slightly higher than a, than what it would have cost you to rent that same property yes. So it is, it, it's relatively accessible mm. at this, at the moment. Mm. And as a company at Central Developments, why is it so important for you guys to build housing that is accessible to the average South African? Besides the fact that it makes business sense, mm. it is also our pride and our pleasure to be able to improve lives mm. with the products that we offer. Uh, we work a little differently as other developers. We own the land that we develop on. We project manage it. We do the town planning. We do the in-house marketing. We build, We are the builders on site. So we are able to cut out middlemen. And thankfully, we are then able to deliver a high quality product, often as much as 20 to 30% lower than the market. Sure. That's quite incredible. I mean, I'm currently in the building process and I think it's a joke because I didn't know a thing, right? So you literally go and you get enticed to buy the stand, you buy a stand and then you're hit with, there needs to be an architect that needs to draw. Then you've got to submit to municipal, whoever. Then you've got to submit to HOA, your plans, and you have to pay every single time. There's all, it feels like at every step, there is a payment that I need to make. And I think a lot of South Africans don't know that. We don't, we're not very sure of what is this building process that developers go through when they are building. So perhaps maybe you can tell us a little bit about that. I know that there's things like bulk, bulk buying, bargaining, you know, all of those things, land, servicing the land, making sure that you're working with the municipality to get, re, you know, resources connected. Can you take us through that a little bit? Yeah, buying a vacant land yeah. in an estate, is incredibly rewarding. Mm. Um, we all want to express our creativity mm. Mm. and customize the house 
to our specific needs. It's incredible. It's unbeatable. It's costly. And, and it's <laughs> very expensive. Yeah. We often get people walk in here and they say, but my friend is a builder. He can build this house for six and a half thousand and a yes. square meter. Mm. Yes. Go talk to him and find out after you've paid all those costs, the attorneys, the architect, the NHBRC, you're closer to 10, 11, 12,000 and construction costs. Yeah. And that's not even factoring in aspects like interim interest mm. and holding costs mm. and that type of thing. No, property is very expensive. Our company, Central Developments, specializes in sectional title schemes. We have full title mm. stand uh, developments as well. Um, but in our sectional title schemes, we are able to buy in bulk. Mm. And we have a construction team on site. Your management of a team of building one house or a team building 10 houses is about the same. Mm. And now we can buy stock in bulk from the suppliers and we can get bulk discounts. Mm. So you can optimize the assembly line with a sectional title scheme. So you're getting a stunning product and the price is amazing. Mm. Mm. Um, the costs in building and the regulatory environment, we have so many hoops to jump through. Yeah. From building quality, inspectors, town planning hoops that we need to jump through, Property development is not for everybody. <laughs> it's definitely not for it's, I know for a fact now that it's definitely not for me. Um, it looks really attractive on the outside. And I think it's one of those things that you're speaking about is knowing that I can customize this house of mine to what exactly I want it to be. But we, first and foremost, I, I am a BA student, right? I don't have friends that work in construction. So even just on the onset, when I'm trying to find somebody to draw this thing for me, I'm having to now put it out on social media and say, guys, do you know an architect? And then you get all sorts of unscrupulous people also trying to offer you services. So I think just based on that, it is always advisable to go to the guys who actually understand and know what it is that they are doing. But you spoke about um, central developments working in the space of sectional title. Now, sectional title is something that a lot of South Africans don't seem to understand. In your plainest English, what is a sectional title scheme? So sectional title has its roots. Uh, in blocks of flats. Okay. So if you would imagine 10 flats mm -hmm. side by side, 10 stories high, giving you 100 flats. Yes. Who owns the land? The Everybody. Oh, because they're all on one. Uh, mm. Who owns the roof? All of us. All because of my roof is your roof and it's your roof. The lift. Yes. Who owns it? All of us. Everybody. So that's where a sectional title has its roots, it's legislation that came in in the 70s. So that now, instead of buying shares in a company that gives you uh, use of a specific unit number or whatever, mm. you can now have the title deed of that property. Ah. So it's a relatively modern concept. The lights have just gone on. <laughs> and then, who, main, who mops the passages? The people that we hire. So you, as a community of 100 yes. owners, you contribute to a common purse and from that purse we can pay the security we can pay the cleaners we can main, service the lift so that the guy on the 10th floor can still reach his flat and that's where the levy concept comes from oh, i don't think i've ever had anyone explain it so easy to me because that makes sense i mean i was actually thinking about it that i'm like oh, if you build flats on top of each other it's actually so much cheaper because you don't have to worry about buying roofs for each and every single house but now that you've explained it like that and you've put it plainly as sectional title it, it starts to make sense right however there are still contentious issues and, and 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 i think they come from when the development originally belongs or is from a developer directly because for a long time the, the developer will still own a majority of those units within there how does one maneuver that how does one in fact what are the the the, the and i would say maybe what are the rights of your as of owners that are buying into that sectional development <laughs> developers often uh, or people mm. st start calling themselves a developer they think there's ma massive profits in doing this so that whole planning and getting that community going very often goes for a loop. Ah. And that's where the big um, negative rap that sectional title has comes from, yeah. unfortunately. 
Luckily, in our scenario, we're able to build it very quickly. Mm. So you have a very short period where there's that overlap. Mm. You've got the developer that still owns a part of it, and then you've got new owners whose properties are starting to register. Yes. So how we address that on the monthly expenses side, we get the development going with full services. Ah. Full security complement on site, garden services, 100% operational. And then we've calculated the costs carefully based on real quotes yes. from service providers. Yes. And then the owners start paying the levies as their properties register. And then we pick up the difference. Ah. So there is a, there's a bit of a shortfall and we cover that shortfall. Yeah. So there's okay. actually, when, when, when the handover happens to the new body corporate, all those services are already in place. Yes. That's quite important. It's, it's critical. And then as the phase is registered until the last phase and the last unit registered, as a developer, we walk away. Mm. And that community of owners, they are in control of their own property and their own fate. Mm. And they can make decisions that is governed by the Sectional Title Act. So let's talk about uh, uh, segueing back to property in South Africa. For you, as Marius, with your children growing up in this country, what are some of the things that you'd like to see happen within the property sector? <laughs> That's a tricky... I, I do invest in mm. property to rent out. Mm. Uh, my personal investment attitude or approach is to buy the smaller properties that I can get a bond on, mm. put a tenant in, mm. and pay it off for my retirement. Yes. And the idea is that my children can inherit that. So uh, my personal appetite is that kind of scenario. Mm. Mm. And I tend to buy the small units in a nice development where there are bigger houses as well. Okay. So I'd like, I personally like to see more of that, mm. um, those types of developments that is not just blocks of flats, endless blocks of flats. Mm. And my investment strategy is not specifically big houses to yeah. rent out. Um, the, the, the cash flow on the rental and so on you have to almost is easier on the smaller units. Yeah, and you have to manage it well because if you don't, you find yourself in a situation where you think you've bought a fixer upper of a house and it becomes a nightmare for you. Yeah, if you're not a builder, don't yeah. go there. Yeah, no, definitely. I agree with that. Talk to me about your experience with renting. I mean, I have had some interesting tenants. <laughs> yes, the, I have been very blessed Okay. in, in my personal investment pro yeah. portfolio. I've only had excellent tenants. Yeah. One of my tenants didn't like the kitchen. He ripped it out and he redid it. He oh, was a nice. cabinet maker and I scored a new kitchen. Oh, nice. So um, that that's... That I've only had great experiences. Yeah. As a company, we have about 6,000 rental units under direct administration. We mm. own it and we rent it out. Mm. The figures speak for itself. Yeah. We have less than a 1% vacancy rate. Mm. We've got less than a 1% bad debt rate. People mm. that are 30 days or more in arrears. Mm. So our data proves property investment and renting it out works. Yeah. The critical part of that is the placement of a tenant. Yes. Doing a proper credit check, Absolutely. doing a proper in inspection, and and having a written lease. Mm. Those three things, if you do that, you eliminate 90% of your headaches. Mm. If you are not in property management mm. or in property, it is highly recommended that you use a professional yes. rental agent to help you manage that property. Let's talk um, a, a couple of tips before I let you go in terms of, in fact, I want to talk tips, I want to talk secrets. So I know they have property secrets. <laughs> in, in How does one climb the property ladder? You know, I think a lot of us buy property, then we get stuck at the first property or we get stuck in this, the, something, you get discouraged by, you know, your first investment um, property. I don't know if maybe we are just overzealous and we think some magical wealth is going to come from it. What would you say are some of the secrets that people need to know when it comes to investing in property? It's a slow process. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as getting rich quick. There's nothing quick in property. It's a, it's a long haul, it's a marathon. Mm -hmm. It's not a sprint. Mm -hmm. So that is critical. And keep your ear on the ground. Yeah. Um, read up on it, educate yourself, uh, watch YouTube channels like this, mm -hmm. and pick up the tips. Yeah. 
visit developers in their show houses. Pick the brain of those marketing guys. Some of them talk nonsense, some of them know what they're talking about. And it's an education process, you need to educate yourself because there is massive opportunity in property. And, but you need to be savvy. You need to understand how the process works. So a couple of tips, if you can get onto a developer's database, uh, that's a secret society guys critical yes. <laughs> yes then they will launch to their database before starting to advertise on facebook and property 24 and so on yeah. so then you can get in on the action buying in the first phase or the second phase is very beneficial but don't miss the boat if you, even if you buy the last unit in the last phase yeah. very often the math makes sense yeah Definitely. I, I can I can totally vouch for that because I've literally seen it happen with some of central developments properties where you literally come in in the beginning, you buy this thing, even before it's even transferred into your name, you could literally sell it and still make a, a good growth, I mean, a profit. So that, that's quite interesting. We have colleagues that buy into the, the, our developments. Yeah. We, are, we do that often mm -hmm. um, and we like getting in quickly. We hold on to it. Yeah. I mean, it takes a while for it to be built. Yeah. And then by the time that you get keys, there's already growth in the property. Yeah. You have, didn't have the risk. You weren't settling home loan. You mm. weren't paying levies. Mm. You weren't paying rates. Mm. And the property growth took place mm. just while you're waiting for transfer. Mm. It's, it's often uh, powerful. Mm. Uh, it's that thing where people talk about buying, buying property without, what? without using money. That sometimes they get it wrong because they, you know, and the thing is, everybody sings this hymn, you can buy property without money, you can buy property without money, yeah. but they don't, they forget that you still need to get the home loan approved. Yes. And that essentially is money because they look at your affordability and they look at your credit. So, you now if you can't afford it, don't buy property. Don't do that. Yeah. Um, but you do need a good, so the, the tips is you need a good cash flow. Absolutely. Protect your income. Da pay your accounts. Mm -hmm. Get rid of debt. Mm -hmm. But there is a healthy debt yes. to be to be had in property, yes, yes, and yes. it's incredibly powerful. Mm. I actually call a, a property debt a forced saving because you are actually being forced to save back into an asset that's going to appreciate anyway. It would be an injustice if I did not squeeze in this question, right? Marius, one of my chapters in my book is I hate my house and I'll tell you why because when I bought my house my real estate agent or the sales agent sold it on future right so she sold it on me reselling the house uh. but when I moved into the house you know I bought more house than I needed definitely yes. I have a pool I don't swim so that's pretty much costing me so much money Location is great, but I'm paying location tax on everything. Oh, yes. When they're coming to do my plumbing, it's location tax. When you know, it's it feels like I've made a mistake, and I need you to tell me whether I've made a mistake or they saving grace for this thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's always the starting point when looking at property. Yeah. Is does the property address your needs? Yeah. And needs can change. If you're already pregnant, then you need to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. But buying a big house is a very, it's a very common mistake um, because a bigger house comes with bigger expenses. Absolutely. Um, and we have, we see people buy houses on ego. Yeah. yeah. Very often. So if you can keep that ego monster at bay. Uh, and you, you're really honest with yourself with what you really need, mm. you're going to save yourself a lot mm. Mm. Um, on, on frustrations and, and that type of thing. Look, I'm absolutely frustrated. And in fact, I actually tried to sell. Um, I tried to sell, but it was just as the lockdown was happening. Oh, nice. Yes. So I was told no hold off because property prices for houses like yours have gone all the way down to what they used to be in 2015. So now it's confusing because everybody's saying it's a buyer's market. Great, it's a buyer's market, but we're still seeing certain properties struggle. Why is that? It's heavily driven by, by affordability. Yeah. Uh, so we find under the 3 million bracket, the property market is booming. Yeah. Above the 3, three million and bracket, people are very choosy. Mm. They shop around like crazy mm. and it does get tougher. Mm. The buyer does get amazing value for money in that range because you can generally buy a nice big house mm. in that price range. Under 3 million is very tough. Mm. 
It's always a great time to buy houses. It's always a horrible time to buy a house. It's always great time to sell and it's always horrible. <laughs> the horrible time to sell. Yeah. Because if you're selling at, a, at the peak, you're going to be replacing that property at the peak. Yes. If you're selling in the trough, you're going to replace in the trough. So it pans out to the end. That's actually quite true. That's quite true. Look, I mean, I don't know if I've gotten a bit of comfort in terms of my house, but um, my belief is always going to stay the same. And I think it's because of the strategy that I employ when it comes to property. I believe that my asset is going to do some great things because that's exactly what property does. Now, we have been having a conversation with Marius Brando and he's been absolutely fantastic in really getting us to understand some of the things that we wonder about when we're sitting all by ourselves in the property industry. Thank you very much for tuning in and please do remember to stay centered around property.